Hello, hello, this is Rachel with Things We Wear, and today I'm gonna to continue with the process of creating a tech pack for my t-shirt. So the last video I did, we created this really cute, clear and concise picture of a t-shirt. This is a technical sketch, and because it's a technical sketch, it is gonna be drawn as if you're looking at it flat, not on a body. Um, and the whole point of it is to be very clear so that your vendor, factory, anyone you're working with, cutting room can look at this and know exactly what they're making based on this image. You want it to be simple, clear, and also printable in black and white. So if you missed that video, I will put a link down to it and probably a card right here. And uh, so when I create a tech, um, a tech pack, usually it starts with design giving me some sort of design uh, inspiration, a sketch. It can be in various forms. Sometimes I get uh, an actual sample like hey I want this something like this but a little bit like this and if if it's someone I've been working with for a while I usually can kind of fill in the blanks and say like oh hey do you want that kind of finishing that we did before etc cetera, etc cetera. and then the first thing that I do is create a technical sketch usually creating a technical sketch is a great way for me to just sort of think through all the details of the garment that I'm going to be making and as I'm drawing it sometimes questions pop into my head so as I'm drawing this I might think hey you know what we didn't talk about if the back neck is going to have some sort of finishing on it we didn't talk about where it will end usually you know is it going to end before the shoulder seam or will ext will that back neck tape extend from from sh basically the top of the sleeve cap to the other top of the sleeve cap um, maybe we didn't talk about hem height maybe we didn't talk about a shape of the armhole so these things can come up sometimes you know you have a design pass off and you think you know what's going on and then you start to get into the details and as the tech designer suddenly you think hey you know what maybe I don't know all of the details <laughs> so this is why I do the sketch first once I get the sketch done and I reach out to the designer in case I need anything more then I can begin building the rest of the tech pack. So today we're going to build a graded spec page and I'm going to show you how to do that and what I like to think about when I build a graded spec page. So I'm going to do it in Excel today. I think Excel is just like the best program in the world. <laughs> I love Excel. Um, I have worked in lots of PDM and PLM systems. Um, let me just explain PLM and PDM for those of you who are new or aspiring tech designers or just kind of like want a little refresher on the software that's out there. Um, so a PDM system is a product detail management system. And basically that's just a system that you can create a tech pack in. So uh, lots of people in maybe about 10 or so years ago use these systems. And it's just a way that you can um, upload different pages to a PDM system that lives on an intranet um, within your company so that different people in different departments can contribute to it. So your designers can upload sketches, uh, you can upload your, uh, your graded spec pages, you can upload fit comments, the fabric team can up upload fit information and wash information. So it's sort of like a collaborative tool. And the nice thing about it is each person can kind of own their own pages and you can link to other styles. So if you have, uh, let's say uh, you're doing, you're working for a company and you have all the same labels on every single style, well then you can just make one label page and link it to all the other styles. And then that way it's always updated and accurate and you don't have to keep redoing that work. That is the benefit of having a PDM system. PLM systems are product lifestyle systems or product lifestyle management systems. And what they do is track the style from its origin birth. So they're not just for basically like a product detail is more about like once it's in that pre-production phase and it's getting ready to be produced and you're working with a vendor um, to pass it off and produce it into production. A product lifestyle management system, it goes over the course of the whole style's life. So from conception of when is just a little baby style and it's you know first being floated around and it's being reviewed by merchandising and different design teams and line planning teams and then all the way through until it becomes an official style that's going to be in pre-production phase and then be produced and so that way it can carry all of the information throughout the beginning of the style to the end of the style and the whole point of these systems is really to kind of like uh, get a more robust idea of all the data that's going into these styles so that someone on a higher level can look and see 
how many styles were developed versus how many styles actually made it to production, um, how many styles had issues in production, you know, how many styles were, were developed by each designer, what each uh, fallout rate is. Um, so there's a lot of, the idea is a really good one. The problem with a PLM system, and I haven't found one that really has solved this well yet, is that what is important in a pre, in a development phase is different than what's important when you get into a production phase. Um, you know, merchandisers, uh, planners, they're thinking about uh, SKUs, colorways, um, whereas tech designers are are not. So we wouldn't consider, if we had a t-shirt and it came in 15 colors, we would still consider that one style, right? And if that t-shirt kept getting repeated every season, we probably wouldn't want to redo that work every season. We'd probably say, okay, we've already done it once, just keep going with it and maybe we'll look at it once a year or something. Um, but because of the way merchandising and planning looks at things and maybe design, um, they're looking at every single color. Let's say it's an existing style, but this season it's in new colors. Well, so to a merchandiser, that's kind of like a new style. That's a different skew number for them. Uh, but for tech design, it's not. So they're like, hey, this is a style we already did. We don't need to do this again. So there's a lot of things that sort of just don't like align in those processes. And that information that's important just doesn't quite trickle down in the same way. Um, I haven't really found any PLM systems that deal with this in an efficient way. I'm not sure what the right answer is. In my opinion, I think it's very wishful thinking to find a system that is going to be the answer to every single department's problems. And I found that more people are turned off by PLM systems than turned on by them. So this is why I love Excel. Excel is simple, it's easy to use, it can do so much, you can run so many reports from it, you can gather data from it. Um, yes, it's probably not super great for a very large company, uh, but if you are a small company with only a few tech designers, I think Excel is great. You can do so much with it. and. Um, it's very versatile, which is why I love it. All right, so that's my little spiel about PLM PDM. But if you're a tech designer, you're probably gonna be working in a PLM or PDM system in which you're gonna pull in specs that are probably um, predetermined for you or maybe you're copying from an existing style. But I'm just gonna talk you through it. What if you're not? What if you're the only tech designer and there are no graded specs? Let's just pretend that that's the situation and um, I will show you what to do. So we are going to make this graded spec page and um, first we want to ne we need to know what our base size is. I'm going to put this in red here and then I'm going to maybe just like color it blue. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's pretend this is our base size and it's medium. And let's decide we have a large, we have an extra large, we have a double XL. We have a small, an extra small, and a double extra small. Okay, so now let's just, just, just to kind of chat about it, let's assume that's a, whoops, that is not the 10th of August. No, no, no. This is in size 8 to 10. This is going to be a size 12 to 14. This is going to be a size 16 to 18, and it's going to be a size 20 to 22. Okay, so we'll just work backwards from here. Size, uh, size 4 to 6, size 0 to 2, and this one is size, just a single size, size 0, 0. Or it could even be a size 0, 0 to 0, 0, 0. <laughs> Oops, two zeros, there we go. Okay, so just illustrating here that when we're talking about graded spec pages, generally speaking, if you're working for a company that has an existing size chart or not, um, usually this is about how sizes are broken down in the United States. Um, we usually break down two numeric sizes per alpha size. And I'm sorry, I didn't preface this. This is assuming this is a women's style. So this is how we would do women's sizing um, men's sizing doesn't have the numeric size correlations. They're usually uh, like a chest size, like size 42 or 46. Um, so if this was women's, 
8 to 10 is often a medium, 4 to 6 is a small, 0 to 2 an extra small, and double zero, extra, extra. Um, of course, this shifts. Different companies have different ways of breaking it down. So this is not an end-all, be-all, and it's super subjective, and it just depends on the company you work for and the demographic of people you're trying to fit. So always take it with a grain of salt, but this is just kind of a general average of what a lot of people do just to give you an idea. Okay, so usually when we do a graded spec page, we are going to start from the top down. So we have this neck width here, or I'm sorry, usually I like to start, okay, there's two different ways. You could start top down and start with neck specs, shoulder, across front specs, body specs, and then sleeve. Or you could start with the really important specs, which are length, width, and then you can come back to neck and then sleeves. So it kind of depends on your company, also what you prefer. Sometimes I like to start top bottom because when you're measuring, it's just simple. Uh, it kind of depends on your how you're feeling. But let's say I'm going to do it based on what specs I think are important. So POM meaning point of measure. So the first point of measure I'm going to do is HPS length from shoulder. Nope, oops. Um, to hem. Okay, so high point shoulder length is basically the length at the highest point of your shoulder here to bottom. And this is generally going to be measured unless otherwise specified at the area where it folds. So often on a t-shirt, and this is something that we don't talk about enough, often on a t-shirt, when you lay out your t-shirt flat, that shoulder seam is going to be right there kind of rolled to the front. Um, so so high point shoulder is not there. It's not at that seam. It's where the garment naturally folds, okay? So just something to keep in mind. It is not from the shoulder seam unless specified. Okay, so for, let's say, a women's t-shirt, it could be 24. It's pretty normal. Um, then I'm going to do other big specs. So I'm going to do chest and sweep. Well, Mm. Boy, tough call. Yeah, I'm going to do chest and sweep. Sweep. You could also call this bust. So chest is often measured at one inch down from underarm. And the reason is, particularly for women, our fullest point is, I don't know that I would even say, well, yeah, maybe one inch is, it depends on the demographic. So one inch down from underarm, about right here, so we're kind of saying that this area is the fullest part for a woman. Depending on your demographic, also depending on her bust size, it might be lower or higher. So this is kind of like what a lot of people do, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right thing for your brand. So it is important that you kind of like look at your fit model, look at your established standards for body size and shape, and then decide where you're gonna measure the chest. Sometimes for plus size, I do two inches down, and I do that because often their fullest point of bust is actually a little bit lower, but it really depends. So that's kind of a decision that you have to decide. At the end of the day, these are just measurements to help you guide their reference, right? All these are our measurements and a way of communicating. This is just another way of saying, hey, factory, we want this to be an inch longer. Hey, factory, we want this to be an inch wider. It doesn't really matter if you measured your length from here or from the shoulder seam or you measured your chest at the underarm point or two inches down. None of that matters. At the end of the day, it's just about communicate using those, those numbers to communicate to your factory and also using them in the fitting to derive information from your designers and other team members who have input on where you're going with the style. Okay, so I guess the one thing I would say that does matter is you kind of want to keep it consistent with the other product in your brand, and that way it makes it easier for comparison and to make sure that fit is stable from one style to another, enabling your customers to order something online and get what they want, right? And make sure it fits them. <laughs> okay, so sweep, we're going to say we're going to measure it, um, sweep at bottom opening, measure straight. So meaning in case you have a curved hem, 
Generally, I would say you're going to measure straight because that's actually the measurement that really matters. Um, even if this is curved, it doesn't give you anything additional when it comes to width. And on a t-shirt, this isn't a big deal, but on a skirt or dress where the hem would definitely be a bit curved, you would want to specify that you're measuring straight. I also like to, even if you think there's merit in measuring on the curve, I think measuring straight is a lot simpler and um, you're less likely to have the mistakes when you measure simple measurements. Once measuring gets too difficult, you're going to have more um, discrepancies between you and other people who are measuring the garment, like the factory, QC team. So whenever possible, keep it as simple as possible. If you have a measurement you really want to track, or maybe your designer keeps referring to something in a certain way, you can always say, like, let's say your designer likes to measure the sweep along the curve. You can say uh, sweep along curve for internal use only. And then that way in your fitting, you can talk about it and then you can use that number to inform what this number should be and just kind of like you can either hide, hide that row for your vendor or you can just gray it out or something, but just so it doesn't confuse them. Um, and then you can keep it for yourself, internal use, but you don't need to use it when it comes to a more uh, production friendly kind of um, usage. Okay, so we talked about sweep. So now we're going to go back up to the top. We're going to say across shoulder. I'm going to say across back at five inches. Usually across front and back are often in somewhere between five and six inches. Depends on the style. Um, but the point of across front and back is really just to give you a point to gauge where that curve is so that you can, again, have a point of reference to talk about in your fitting. One thing I would suggest uh, if you're able to prep your own garments prior to the fitting is just put a little mark on the garment where that five inches is. And then you can put a little mark here and there right at the armhole. And that way in the fitting, if you are seeing that things aren't looking good to you or the designer mentions the across front, you know exactly where that point is so you can adjust it accordingly. And you're not kind of guessing like, oh, I think that's at five inches down. I'm not really sure. Just go ahead, mark it with a piece of tailor's chalk or maybe a little safety pin. There's a lot of ways you could do it. A little piece of tape. Um, I prefer chalk, but it depends on if you're allowed to mark your garment. So do what you must across back, across front at five inches from high point shoulder. Let's see what else we got. Okay, so we did those specs. We're gonna do shoulder slope and it's gonna be the measurement from here to there on the y-axis. So it's gonna be whatever this distance is. Now we're gonna do neck specs. So we'll do neck width um, at seam, Oops, from seam to seam. So we're gonna measure from where this banding is, seam to seam. And the reason we're gonna do that is because on your pattern, you're gonna measure from seam to seam. The banding is a separate piece of rib, and so it's a little confusing to include the banding. If your designer insists on working with neck width, talking about neck width in, ter in terms of interior width, um, then you can always, again, include an internal use only and then just adjust the one for your external partners. But I find seam to seam to be much more effective for external partners for being production friendly, QC, all of that good stuff. Okay, so now we're gonna do front neck drop. So front neck drop, also known as F and D for shorthand, from high point shoulder to seam. So that is gonna be measured from this point here to this point here, and it's gonna be a vertical measurement. Uh, we're gonna do back neck drop from head point shoulder to seam. And we're not gonna do, so sometimes you'll see people have neck circumference measurements in there. You can do that if you want. I would say it's better just to specify what your dimensions are in the X and Y axis, as in the neck width is the X axis and the Y axis is your front and back neck drops. And that will inform the total circumference. Um, so I wouldn't, 
Well, it's hard to predict what that measurement's going to be, and I feel like that's a little tricky. Um, the only reason I would do it is if you are trying to do something that's a woven, that's not stretchy, and that's supposed to fit really close to neck, but that's like a really different application. So in this case, I think we're just going to stick with those simpler specs here, and then um, we can do a minimum neck stretch. So this is something a lot of brands add in as like a way to test the garment to make sure that you can get it over your head easily, because of course, getting it over your head is a pretty big important deal. <laughs> and it's something you want to think about, particularly on the smaller sizes. So it might be fine on a size medium, but as you grade down in sizing and your neck gets smaller, as it often does, you might not be able to meet that minimum neck stretch. I would say measure, you know, probably the smallest you want to go is like 22, 21. You definitely can get it over your head on a smaller measurement, but it's kind of about comfort too and, and what's comfortable for you or your customers. Um, sometimes I notice, I feel like kids stuff is really small in the neck. Now that I think about it, I've been helping my sister take care of my nephews and uh, it's always so hard to get those t-shirts over their heads. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but, uh, neck stretch, minimum neck stretch is super important and that's a great place where it is very important. Um, so you do want to monitor it and then start to think about it, um, as you're fitting it. So you could say that it's going to be 22, but you can adjust this and, um, based on like what the smallest number you want to get to, like let's say you don't want it to go less than 22, then that will help inform how much you're going to grade the neck down as you get smaller in sizes. Okay, so we did the neck measurements. Now we're going to do sleeves. So first, often I like a, an armhole straight measurement. Some people do armhole straight from high point shoulder, so it's basically this vertical Y measurement from here and it stops at an imaginary line across here. Um, I understand the idea of that measurement because that is more of a true, if you think about your body, that's something that as a company you could be a little more standard about, like, oh, we definitely want that to be like 12 inches or something. Um, I feel like it's a little hard to say because of course that's all dependent on how wide your neck is. If you have a really wide neck, then 12 inches is gonna be down here. But if it's a more narrow neck, 12 inches might be right there. So I think armhole straight is perfect. It at least gives you a gauge of how low the armhole is. Um, and this is, there's no right answer for armholes. It really depends on how close it's sitting to your body. If it's off your shoulder, maybe you don't need it to be as big. If it's really close to your body, maybe you do need it to be a bit bigger because it needs to really hug around the curves of your arm. So it kind of depends what you're going for, but I'm just going to include armhole straight. One thing I also do um, often, just to kind of for my own sanity, especially if you have a more complicated style, like let's say I had a kangaroo pocket and a hood, I will break up my, P, my POM pages like this, so that it's just like simpler for me to quickly read it and see it as I'm um, in a fitting. Because sometimes trying to like get all the numbers straight in your head can be a little tricky. Um, okay, so we can do, insert shoulder, and I can call that bodies, oops. I don't know, or main measurements, whatever feels right for you. Armhole straight. Okay, so we're also gonna do, um, gonna do a sleeve length. You can do from center back or from shoulder. What I like about center back is it's a truer length. So you can move this across shoulder. Like let's say I wanted to move this across shoulder out. That would change the length of my sleeve a lot, but it might not change the total length of my sleeve from from center back neck. So from the perspective of design, if they're liking where the sleeve is hitting on the body, talking about it from center back neck does make it a little simpler. So I'm gonna write from center back neck, see, center back neck, CBN, and then I'm also gonna include sleeve length from shoulder 
internal use only. I like to have that because when I'm doing the pattern, I need to know what the sleeve length should be. And then that way I can make sure it has enough shrinkage and it's gonna come out on spec. Um, you're also gonna do, let's say a bicep at one inch below armhole. So that's gonna be measured from here straight across. And you can do a sleeve opening. Um, actually I might do straight, measure straight because often the armhole is on a bit of a curve. Now, if you are the one doing the pattern, a few additional measurements I might include are, um, or, you know, honestly, if you're just a check designer that who's really good at fit, here are some other specs that I would, I would measure. I don't know if I would necessarily dictate this to the factory if they're overseeing the pattern, but it's something important for you to track and have an idea of so that you can communicate revisions to the pattern maker if you need to, or just have a stronger understanding of the fit. So for one, there's gonna be sleeve cap height. So this is gonna be the distance from basically the underarm to the cap, this vertical, if you were looking at the sleeve straight on, it's gonna be like from here to there. So <clears throat> on a cap sleeve, a really short sleeve, uh, you might have a really short cap height. But on a sleeve that's a long sleeve, you might have a higher cap height, maybe five and a half or something. Um, so it really depends on the desired fit of your garment, on uh, how the armhole fits. These are related to why your sleeve cap might be taller or shorter, but it's an important thing to kind of keep in mind. And if you have styles that really should fit consistency, consistently across different fabrications, knowing what the sleeve cap height can help you ensure that the fit is pretty consistent. It might not be the exact same sleeve cap height because different fabrics are gonna drape differently and they have different uh, vertical stretch in them. So there's not one right answer there, but knowing that information, again, information is power. Okay, so sleeve cap height, I'm gonna do an armhole total measurement. I'm also gonna do front armhole along curve, back armhole along curve, and then sleeve cap along curve. So why do I include all of these? internal sleeve measurements. <clears throat> Here is why. So cap height I just explained, the front and back armhole, you're gonna be measuring along this curve. And the reason I say that is because sometimes you're gonna adjust the ratio of front to back to improve your fit. So if you're having a lot of gaping in the front, you might reduce your front armhole more in real, uh, compared to the back. Um, and so it's nice to kind of like know what the difference is. Is your front armhole three eighths smaller? Is it an inch smaller? These are things that are helpful for you to know and understand about how your t-shirt is fitting you or fitting your model. Um, you also maybe want to know the total length of your sleeve cap and the total length of your armhole. Um, if you have a lot of like puckering at the top of your sleeve cap, it may be that your sleeve cap is too long compared to your armhole. So I, I find that in knits, I'm actually gonna do this because these are related. So I would want them to be next to each other. In knits, I find I often want the armhole to be less than, I'm sorry, the sleeve cap to be less than the armhole. In wovens, I know they often say that you want there to be some ease. To be honest, I think it really depends on the style, the function, the way you're building the pattern. There is no right answer to that. It really depends on what you're going for. But I find for a t-shirt, it works better. If the sleeve cap is less than the armhole, at the very, at the most, it would be the same. So sometimes it's the same, but I find it usually does better. If it's a little bit less, it just lays a little flatter. Everybody loves it. Um, the other thing you can measure is sleeve inseam length. That's gonna be this measurement right along here. And that is akin to the cap height. So it's just kind of giving you another gauge of like, hey, I have a sleeve that's only seven inches long, but the inseam is three and a half. It's just another data point that you can use to compare across different styles in case you need to do a comparison. Just kind of helpful to know. All right, <laughs> so we finally did this. Here's my graded spec page. Woo woo. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and fill in some measurements. So body length, we'll say 24. Chest, let's say this is kind of a boxy tee for a woman. So I'm gonna make it 20, that's a 40 inch total. When we're doing knits, usually we're talking on the half. So 
20 inches is going to be just from here to there. It's not going to be a total circumference measurement. Um, I should probably include that one inch down chest half measurement sweep half measurement. Okay, so 20, 20 inches at the chest. Let's say the sweep, I'm going to make it 21. Um, if you wanted it along curve, I'm not going to have that this time. Since it's a boxy fit, I'm going to make the across shoulder a little bit wide too. Let's say it's like 19, so it's kind of off the shoulder. Um, across front and back might be less important if you're doing a boxy fit, um, but uh, it kind of depends where you're going for. So I'm going to say that's 19. Across front and back are usually, let's say across back is like a little bit less, 18 and a half, and across front is a little more or less. So sometimes I like to see this difference, like the across front to be about an inch smaller than the across back. Um, it's also about getting the shape that you want. And on a relaxed t-shirt, sometimes that's a little, little tricky. Shoulder slope, again, related to how closely it's fitting to the body. You can also utilize shoulder, shoulder slope to try to correct um, hiking issues on a t-shirt. So I'm just going to start out with it being like one and a quarter. And then we can we can move around from there. Let's say my neck width seam to seam. If I'm doing a crew neck and I wanted it to be edge to edge six and a half. Oh, you know what? I forgot to include neck rib neck rib banding height. Let's say that's one inch or nah. Let's say it's a uh, three quarters. Um, so six and a half, an inch and a half. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna say eight for my neck width seam to seam. Front neck drop, let's make it four. Back neck drop, let's make it one. Hmm. Yeah, one and a half, sure. And minimum neck stretch, let's make it 23. Um, armhole straight, I'm gonna say nine inches, sleeve length from center back length. Uh, well, let's see here. So the way you get this sometimes i work backwards if i know i want my shoulder my sleeve length from shoulder seam to be let's say seven then this is going to equal the short sleeve length plus half of the across shoulder divided by two cool so that's going to be my sleeve length from center back neck and my bicep let's say it's six and a half and sleeve opening six Okay, and these are gonna be my internal measurements, and I'm gonna only record them for my own use, so we don't have to worry about them for an internal graded spec measurement. So sorry. All right, so now that you have your measurements, um, I kind of made those up on the spot based on what I know about knit t-shirts and how we're gonna do them, um, and you know what I want from this fitting t-shirt. Um, if your designer doesn't give you measurements, uh, this is a great place to start doing some research. If you have a sample you can reference and measure to get those starter measurements, if you have um, sometimes a competitor sample or a reference sample you could measure, um, maybe you have something in your own closet that you think is comparable and is in the right size, or even like a size up, you can always kind of like reduce it a little or pin it up and get that right spec. So that's a good place to start if you don't know where to begin. Um, and then from there, the grading should, if you are working for a bigger company, you probably already have grade rules for everything. Um, if you aren't, then uh, here's kind of what I would say. For length, usually length is gonna grade about half inch, five eighths per size, but <clears throat> this is relative to the product and the length of the product. So if you have a really long dress, you're probably not gonna make it longer on the larger sizes. The whole reason for making it longer is because as we're talking about women, as you go up in size, they get more length along their bust. So that's um, that's really where you need more length is, is along, um, along the front side of their body, and less so along the back side. Um, they do get, a, as people get larger, there's a slight increase in length as they get kind of bigger all around. It's not that much though. 
So again, this is a great reason why I think you should see every size, or at least see size extra extra large or extra large and extra small on a body in addition to the base size. Um, I think that's important to kind of check out that your grading is yielding uh, a consistent fit on all sizes that's true to the designer's vision. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna say kind of a standard thing. And the way grading generally works is you have this middle column, your base size is gonna have your measurements. And then on the other, uh, on either side of it, it's gonna show you what, um, how it's gonna grow either up or down. So what that means is from medium to large, we're gonna get half inch larger. So that means that the large will be 24 and a half. From large to extra large, it'll be half inch again. So that means my 24 and a half is gonna become 25 and 25 and a half. As we go down, see the minus, it's gonna go from 24, 23 and a half, 23 and 22 and a half. Does that make sense? Pretty simple, right? Okay, so usually in alpha sizing on the half, we do a, a one inch braid. And that's because generally speaking, ASTM, the American Standard um, AST, trades and measurements, hmm. I don't know if I remember that right. I'll have to look it up. But according to ASTM, typically we grade two inches in total circumference per size. Um, and that is for alpha sizes. Uh, so one inch if you're on the half. So we're gonna go up an inch, up an inch, up an inch, minus an inch. And of course your chest and your sweep are gonna grade the same amount because it would be a little weird. Yeah, generally speaking, as people get larger in their chest area, their hips are also gonna grow. So you wouldn't wanna get bigger in one area more so than the other, typically. Of course, there are always exceptions, but again, this is why I'm a big proponent of checking out those larger sizes. Okay, across shoulder, typically the grade is gonna be like a half inch on either side. Sometimes on larger sizes, they grade three quarters strongly against this. I even think a half inch might be too much. But let's say this is 19. Since this is a relaxed fit, I'm fine with it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do minus a half inch in the smaller direction. Now, as I go up, I actually think you probably don't need to get as big. Typically, your cross shoulder would grade a half inch. That's pretty industry standard. As I said, a half inch or a three quarters. What I would recommend for something that's a relaxed shoulder and a little bit off the shoulder, I'd actually say maybe like a quarter. You don't need that much. And you know what? A great reason to check out the larger size, but there's no reason that someone who's larger in their bust area is necessarily larger in their cross shoulder. And if anything, a shoulder that's too relaxed on a large size is just gonna look sloppy. It's not gonna work. All right, so I'm gonna follow the same grading that I did on my across shoulder. So I'm just gonna copy and paste and paste. There we go. Oops, because your cross front and back are gonna follow the same general shaping as your cross shoulder. They're just reference points to measure how that curve is looking and where things are falling on the body. But I think it's perfectly valid that they would follow that same grade up and down as whatever you do on your shoulder. Your shoulder slope usually doesn't grade. Um, this is a little bit arguable, <laughs> I know. And the reason that I would say it doesn't grade is because there is no correlation between the shoulder slope on our body and the size that we are. So actually, if you think about it, um, as someone goes up in size, let's say, let's say they have a very, um, let me see if I can draw something one sec. Okay, let's say you have a strong angle here. This is an inch and a half. As we go out in size, as let's say this goes out and out and out and out and out, now you see that actually if I didn't, if I just kept this level on the x-axis and I didn't go down, if I just keep it level and keep the shoulder slope the same, it's actually as if the person has less of a slope because it's sort of like they're going out but that their slope is reducing, right? It's kind of weird. Um, but if you follow the line of the pattern like this, then you have an increased shoulder slope. 
The reality is that shoulder slope is pretty variable. Um, people just are different, are built differently. I have a pretty horizontal shoulder slope. Some people have very angular shoulder slopes. Some, uh, yeah, and other people are like me and they have kind of shoulders that sort of jut out straight. For, <laughs> it feels like I have like a right angle from my neckline to my shoulders. Um, and that's not really correlated to my size. If I were to lose weight or gain weight, I'd still have the same shoulder slope. So for that reason, we don't usually grade shoulder slope. We just kind of keep it the average of what it typically is, which ASTM says is an inch and five eighths for women. Um, and so whatever you find works on your base size. If that's true to what the demographic is and what your body type is, athletic, you know, whatever it is that you're aiming for, um, it's probably going to be a good place for your other sizes as well. Okay, so back to this, I'm just going to put in zeros. Neck width. Neck width usually grades a quarter of an inch up and down. Of course, this is totally arbitrary um, as necks don't really change in girth all that much. Um, some people, as they gain weight, do gain weight around their neck, but it's not necessarily correlated. Um, there's a lot of variation in there. Usually when we talk about grading a neck, it's more about creating a shape that looks flattering on different body types. So as you go up in size, most women who are larger in the bust don't like a neck that's super close and tight because it, they feel that it makes their bust look bigger and uh, it's a little bit like claustrophobic to those women. Um, and as you go down in size, maybe a smaller woman would look, this neck line would look like kind of big on a smaller woman, but it's not really, uh, there's not really a solid rule on neck width. Um, because yeah, necks and heads don't really grow a lot. Um, so again, it's kind of an artistic thing and really dependent on the shape that you're going for. Sometimes, so let's say we go up a quarter inch per size. Sometimes going down, we might not grade it at all. We might just do zero. And let's say maybe this one gets smaller by a quarter. And the reason I would say that is because Sometimes going down in size, you actually don't want your neck to get smaller because it's then it might get too small and not be able to fit over the head or just look a little weird. So it really depends where you're starting. If this is already a pretty close crew neck, then you're not gonna wanna get smaller. You might wanna just keep it zero going down, quarter inch going up. All right, front neck drop. Usually that's gonna grade an eighth of an inch in either direction. And the reason we do that is just to maintain the same shape as the neck. So the neck is getting basically an eighth inch bigger on either side, a quarter inch total. And then the front neck drop also is getting an eighth inch bigger. So it kind of keeps that shape intact. And that's really why we grade it that way to just maintain that shape. So it is kind of a design detail. In this case, since we're not grading the neck width, we're not gonna grade the front neck drop, keep that shape maintained. But we, whoops, but we will grade the front neck drop maintain the shape on the larger sizes. We'll do the same with the back neck drop, an eighth of an inch. Cool. Minimum neck stretch. So that's going to not get smaller on the smaller sizes. As we go up in size, maybe it'll get a bit bigger. Uh, maybe it's going to get, let's say, a half inch bigger per size based on those measurements. You'd have to actually check it to find out. And this really isn't an important spec to grade per se, because it's just the minimum. Just want to make sure that at the minimum, it makes that measurement. So this could be zero. It doesn't really matter. Neck banding height. Usually you're going to keep that the same on all sizes. Um, if you do have extended sizing, like you go into petites or, or plus, you might want to adjust this a little bit. Maybe for petites, you make it five eighths, just a little bit smaller. So it's not quite so overwhelming on a petite person. But for our purposes today, we're just going to make it a zero inch grade. Okay, armhole typically, so armhole straight typically grows a quarter of an inch per side or three eighths. I actually think it grows about three eighths. It really is dependent on your bicep, on your chest, and trying to get all those pieces fit together. Um, I'm going to say three eighths and it might be subject to change.
maybe only a quarter inch on the smaller sizes. Um, again, I think armhole fit is something you really need to determine based on your customer base. It's very closely related to your bust um, and the way you're fitting things there. So I think it's important to really figure out what works for your for your models and your fit and then implement it from there. Sleeve length from center back neck often it's somewhere between a quarter inch and a half inch. Really depends on the styling. For a short sleeve, I might only do a quarter inch because you don't want it to get too dramatically short on the smaller sizes. Then it would just be weird. And so one thing you'll notice is sleeve length from center back neck, this is related to your cross shoulder. <clears throat> so this is getting smaller by a quarter of an inch. This was getting smaller by a half, which means that this, that your shoulder length from, sh from your shoulder seam, sorry, your sleeve length from shoulder seam is actually not changing at all. So all of that growth is coming from your cross shoulder. Now, as you go up in size, this is getting a quarter inch bigger and your cross shoulder is getting a quarter inch bigger also, which means it just leaves an eighth for your sleeve. You don't really need to calculate that. I'm just calculating it in my head. Again, this measurement is just for pattern making purpose. It's so you know what uh, the pattern should measure and you don't really need to know every size unless you're the one grading it. Um, and then you probably do. <laughs> All right, bicep. Bicep often grades about three eighths per size. Again, you should definitely cross check this. Uh, you can also refer to ACM. There's a lot of different ways you can kind of get this data and decide what's right for you. Okay, now because the sleeve opening is very close to the bicep, I'm actually gonna grade it the same, well, depends. If it's closer to the elbow, above the elbow, I might do a quarter of an inch, a little bit. Well, no, I won't. I'm gonna grade it the same as the bicep because what will happen is the bicep will get more small compared to the sleeve opening. And as you go down in size, your sleeve might start to get a little bell shaped. So I'm gonna follow that shape. And then as you go up, same shape. And that way your sleeve shape is maintained as you go up and down in sizes. Again, this is something specifically you might wanna tweak when you look at a full size run or a jump size set look at it on those models and see if the sleeve opening looks good or if it looks a little weird on your extended side on your sort of extreme ends of the sizes and that'll give you a clue of if this should mirror the bicep or if it should be a little bit less or more for example okay and then these are all of our internal measurements so we don't have to worry about those until we start our pattern and or send it out and get the pattern back from the factory all right so this concludes my POM uh, page here for my tech pack. Um, I'm gonna combine this with my sketch and I think in my next video, I'm gonna do a construction page so you guys can see what that looks like and what, in my experience, a good construction page is and what a bad construction page is because it's important to know the difference. <laughs> um, I think those are really key, key elements of what a tech designer does. Um, and if you didn't see my video about what te tech designers do and why they're important, a lot of what we do is being excellent communicators and being a communi good communicator using our tools. So we're using numbers, we're using sketches like Illustrator, and we're using really clear dialogue like on a construction page. We're communicating in these different ways um, to make sure everyone's on the same page. Our designers, our vendors, our factories, our fabric people, our merchandisers, everyone needs to be on the same page about this product and we're the ones who make that happen. <laughs> All right, so I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you have any suggestions or questions, please leave them in the comments below. And if you'd like to support me on Patreon, I will leave a link down below to that as well. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.